Internet Society. Uh, we are based in Brussels. So any questions you might have about our activities, please find me after this session. So enough commercial for the Internet Society. I'm really happy to welcome you today for this uh, great workshop. I have a great panel that will discuss one of the hottest issues um, those last times, and certainly those last month, and that will be about privacy. Uh, we already had several conversations, not just here in Bali, but also in Baku last year. So I would like to uh, move to the next level, actually. We know that privacy is a really difficult issue. Uh, we don't have any universal definition of privacy. Uh, really, it's just about the context, about the user's expectation, and of course, you have different legislation in different regions of the world. So the question is, how could we, we're talking about the internet, how can we best deal with the different tensions between uh, different legislation, different privacy expectations when it comes to privacy in the online world? Um, there are convergences, there are principles that converge that we will certainly address today. But as I said, I would like to move uh, this conversation to the next level and investigate what are or might be the core principles and strategies that would be needed to achieve a balanced approach to privacy and data protection that is effective both international and regional level. So those are complex issues. Uh, I shall introduce the panel in a few seconds uh, with one general uh, genuine question for all of them. Uh, I would like, before that, uh, make some housekeeping. Thanks to Luca Belli, who joined us today as a remote moderator, helping us to uh, deal with our remote participants. Uh, we have ISOC ambassadors, who are very helpful here too, thanks. And of course, as you know, the golden rule is we want this workshop to be as interactive as possible, so I would invite each of you to just be ready and shoot your question. Um, starting uh, to my right side, we have Sunil, Sunil Abraham, Civil Society. Sunil, you're the Executive Director of the Center for Internet and Society, cis-india.org, based in Bangalore, India, and thanks for joining us. Then we have here, just to my right, uh, I have the pleasure to welcome Margot Zata Steiner, Margot. Um, you are from the Polish government. You are the head of the Department for Analysis and Public Communication in the Ministry of Administration and Digitization in Poland. And you are a very active player in the current discussion on data protection in Europe. And hopefully you will be able to say more about that in a few minutes. To my left, we have Alexandrine Pirlo. Thanks a lot for joining us. You are an advocacy officer with a UK charity founded in 90 called Privacy International whose aim is to fighting for the right to privacy across the world. And you will be able to see much more about that in a few seconds. Then, should I present you Joe, Joe Haladev, well known in this environment. You are uh, the Vice President for Global Policy and Chief Privacy Officer with Oracle. And you have so many several hats uh, in engagement at the highest level, uh, just to mention the OECD to start with, but in many other places. And then last but not least, I have the pleasure to welcome uh, Marie-Georges. Marie-Georges, uh, you are an expert in this field uh, in data processing. You are an expert with the Council of Europe, so you will be the voice of the Council of Europe today, hopefully. Uh, in your career, you also was a high-level advisor to the CNIL, the well-known French Data Protection Authority. So let's start with the first questions which I believe is the most expected question to a panel dealing with privacy. And it is, well, we all heard about those revelation of mass surveillance those days. So I would like to have each of you from your stakeholders group perspective to give me your views on that. And my corollary questions, which is a bit more tricky, would be how do you feel one should restore trust after all of this? certainly in the privacy field. Who wants to start with it before I just take a volunteer? Is there someone? You? Please go. Thank you. Margot. May I take the microphone? Okay, so let me start um, as a government stakeholder. It's not like the easiest uh, place to be right now in terms of the NSA um, uh, revelations. So I will start with the difficult one. Um, so 
uh, we had a lot of attention around PRISM uh, revelations uh, in Poland and many NGOs were very active and asking us questions uh, to what extent we knew about what is happening, uh, to what extent we did something to prevent it and so on. And all those questions um, actually helped us to focus the attention on what we are trying to do anyway to protect privacy. Uh, because as, um, as uh, Frederick mentioned, we are working very actively on the general data protection regulation right now. Uh, and I think there is no better incentive uh, for us and for all the stakeholders to sit together in one table and discuss this topic uh, right now after um, all the citizens um, realized uh, what threats could be to their privacy if we don't have uh, clear, clear rules, transparent rules about uh, how we use our data. Um, so uh, what we did in Poland is we clarified the rules uh, that we have for surveillance in Poland. Um, and, uh, and we think this is an, a very important piece uh, because, of course, uh, it's always like a hard dilemma because on one hand, of course, we don't want to make it harder for police or for any secret uh, services to, uh, to, we don't want to make it harder for them to help, for example, parents find their kids when they are lost, yeah? Uh, we don't want uh, terrorist attacks to happen because somebody couldn't uh, inquire about something. But on the other hand, we do believe that it's a basic principle of rule of law uh, that those issues, those inquiries happen based on clear rules that are v known to the citizens. Yeah? And this is something that we clarified for Poland, so we clarified our, our legal basis for, for this kind of uh, actions. And we are basically like, not right now, of course, Poland is not associated with any, uh, any uh, types of behavior like that. But it also helped us to focus the, uh, the debate on the general data protection regulation because we do think uh, it's a good mechanism, uh, maybe not to address the secret services themselves, yeah, but to address the general concern about our privacy uh, on the internet and how it is protected. Okay. And on restoring trust. Yep. So restoring trust, like the first necessary step, there is no restoration of trust if there is no clarification. And, and I think this is something uh, for which uh, not only Poland is waiting, but the whole EU is waiting. Yeah, there have been uh, questions from Commissioner Redding uh, to uh, high officials uh, on the in, on the U.S. government about like the scale of this um, of the surveillance, because we hear uh, from the press about what might have happened if the scale is confirmed. It is a really um, scary thing, and it is a potential threat we believe to human rights and to democracy as we understand it now. But we have received no. Um, clarifications, no official clarifications so far. So this is there is there will be no rebuilding of trust without um, this issue being uh, fully uh, clarified and explained. Um, and that's the first step. And the second step is for us to to think about uh, regulations that could prevent it. Also for all governments to think about regulations that could prevent uh, the explosion of surveillance and could put it in a, in a f legal framework. Uh, and the third important thing is awareness raising. Yeah, so we need to, as citizens, we need to be aware about what is, uh, what is going on, what are the potential threats, potential usages of data um, in the web, and who can ask uh, for what information um, uh, about us. Yeah? Because in, in a good case scenario, if in a good case scenario, uh, what is happening, it is only really a government inquiring uh, when they want to protect us from uh, from immediate harms and only when it's necessary. Yeah? And that's understandable, and, but that really need, requires a clear rule and, uh, rules and um, control, controlling mechanism to make it legitimate. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Who, who's next? Please. Ah, uh, I'd like to begin by talking about the impact that Edward Snowden had on uh, privacy policy development in India. Uh, there was a process that was started three years ago, and midway through the process, three versions of the bill leaked. Uh, thank God for whistleblowers. And uh, because several stakeholders were unhappy with the text of the bill, uh, the Planning Commission in India asked Justice A.P. Shah uh, to work on a white paper that would influence uh, the configuration of the bill. I was lucky to serve on that committee chaired by Justice A.P. Shah, and we identified the pr privacy principles very like uh, on similar lines as the European Union. The next step was that the Department of Personal and Training was supposed to update the bill, implementing the recommendations of the Justice A.P. Shah committee. Uh, they did so, 
And immediately after the Snowden revelations, we hear that they've decided to go back to policy laundering, to go back to cherry picking worst practices, to join the race to the bottom, and all the safeguards in the interception and surveillance chapter have now been removed again. So that is uh, the impact, the direct impact of Snowden's revelations in India. Uh, how can we rebuild trust? Perhaps this can happen only in a really painful fashion. In India, we have exhaustive know your customer requirements for mobile and internet users. There is also exhaustive data retention requirements for mobile, internet, broadband, uh, uh, cyber cafe users. And all these databases are being combined by a centralized biometric based authentication and identification infrastructure called the Aadhaar project. So what we possibly need is an evil Snowden, somebody who leaks the national biometric database. Uh, then the government will perhaps learn through dreadful consequence that it is very dangerous to go down this route. And then there will be behavior modification, very much like tobacco use. When it causes a crisis in your life, then you rethink tobacco use. Till that point, you never take it seriously, even though you're very aware of the dangers. Thank you. Um, well, I, I think as, uh, as Sunil kind of points out and, and also Margaret to some extent in saying that uh, within Poland they looked at their own surveillance systems and, and, and look, looked at the way they were working. Uh, NSA may be the headline, but the issue is global in scope and nature. Um, so at the end of the day, this has to be both an intergovernmental discussion as well as a societal discussion on how you manage to establish security and respect privacy, because they cannot be mutually exclusive. You have to have a way where you can figure out how to do both. As a society, we expect our governments to protect us, but we also expect them to respect us. And we have to figure out a way to manage that, and at the moment, that has to be through a dialogue. Uh, I think the dialogue is happening perhaps in the newspapers, uh, and we start to see the, the beginning of an intergovernmental dialogue. There are delegations from the EU that have come to the US, there are bilateral conversations between governments. So, you know, we don't know what the outcome of the discussion is, but the discussion is at least seeming to be engaged at the moment. Part of what has to be the end result of that discussion is finding a way to clarify the concept of what is the program, what is, what is it that you are doing at an information level, and then how is it overseen? Because we understand that there will be security apparatuses and nations to help protect the citizenry, but they also have to be appropriately overseen and be held accountable for what they do. And so it's a two-context process. But the problem is um, there are certain legitimate things that governments find difficult to express in detail because it actually uh, may benefit those people who are the exact ones they're trying to protect the country against. And so finding a mechanism to have the conversation so that it's meaningful without having the conversation so that it's detrimental to the security of the nation is a delicate balance which I don't think has probably been reached yet. And then I think the last thing we have to do is there are some established instruments. Even under the new draft of the regulation, there was the concept that it would not necessarily prevent uh, exchanges of information that were developed under mutual, mutual legal assistance treaties. Uh, but what we've heard is that those treaties can sometimes be cumbersome or too slow for having to deal with intelligence information that is acting in a fast fashion. So we may have to revisit some of the instruments or may need to reconsider new instruments uh, in which you may have a structured way of exchanging information so that you can assure that protections are in place uh, and that have reasonable limitations associate them, associated with them, but that are also appropriate in order to achieve the job that needs to be done. So I think we have a lot of moving parts. Uh, we have an ongoing process uh, and hopefully the process yields fruit. Uh, but at the moment, we are at the stage of, of looking to see what's going on and trying to understand how it's working. Um, and uh, I guess we should all be um, participants in the societal dialogue, obs observers of the governmental conversations, and evaluators of what comes out of the process.
Thank you. Just uh, about my corollary question, how could we restore trust? Well, governments were, were in the storm, but some businesses were as well. There were some consumers start distrusting some specific businesses. What's your take about that? Well, I think, you know, the, the concept is, from what I saw of the stories, uh, the participation or the uh, response by business was in response to legal requirements to provide information. Uh, businesses operate in countries, countries have laws. The same way you would expect a business operating in Europe to respect European laws, the business operating in the United States also has to respect United States laws. That would apply to an American company, a European company, an Indonesian company, whatever. And so, you know, it, in many ways, uh, this is why the intergovernmental dialogue is so important because it's the structures of laws that have to be complied with and you have to understand how to manage that and the expectations of that compliance will actually help also to inform the trust. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, um, I, will, uh, I will tell you here uh, what I have been uh, asked to say uh, last week in the Council of Europe where was, uh, there was the meeting of the Convention Committee uh, you know that in the world there is only one international uh, um, binding instrument. It is the Convention 108 of the Council of Europe, open to third countries, and uh, some countries are coming from outside Europe uh, already. Uh, uh, Uruguay and uh, Ma Morocco is on the, the step to come, and others, because many, many, um, I mean, the rate of. Uh, New, new states in the world having data protection based on the same kind of pr principles, because they have been always the same since the 70s, uh, is raising very, very fast. Huh? Uh, now it's 101 uh, countries. Uh, sorry, because uh, US who invented uh, the principles in the 70s did not apply it uh, everywhere, only on certain uh, laws. Okay, Snowden. So what I said, first we have to analyze uh, what was the aim. Was it uh, anti-terrorism? In my view, no. It was spying for economic purpose, and I could give concrete examples, and political uh, spying. So this thing is completely against the rule of interna on international level. You cannot uh, spy another state. It's against the sovereignty. That's first. Um, what to do? Well, there is, of course, the political level. Huh? The political level, what the states will uh, say to uh, America. For this moment, they are asking, uh, as the, our Polish uh, colleague said, clarification clarification. We all know. And we knew even before. Uh, at least uh, since 2003 and 2008. And I can also uh, say what we heard. But we didn't do anything at that time. Now because the proof are there, we think that we have to. It's a question of respect of ourselves. Uh, so there is the political level. After that, there is certainly an uh, economic and ind industrial level. Of course, some countries are going to think everything should not be on clouds, which we don't know where are the servers. You always know where are the servers. Huh? Even uh, the, the U.S. government for years has been saying in, uh, when they were asking for contracts uh, on clouds, the servers being in the United States. Of course, of course. So I think our government will, for the next years, uh, uh, do things. And uh, I know that uh, some um, uh, relationships are taken uh, in Europe between different countries to set up some uh, clouds that uh, won't be aspired by US with their laws, which are completely extraterritorial. Visa, Patriot Act, and so forth. We knew since 2004 that an, an enterprise, an American enterprise, which has uh, other um, affiliates all over the world, huh, they, could, they had to answer questions to their security 
services, if necessary, from everywhere. On the legal uh, level, I would like everybody to think a little bit, and we don't have the answer today. Um, is it normal that a state can take data which has no link with his territory? Not the persons. Huh? It's only transiting or located because a processor, but no other link. This is the sovereignty problem. Uh, I would tell you that since 1995, Europe said the Data Protection Directive, I have been uh, involved much in it, says we don't apply the even the privacy uh, legislation on data which transit only. So think about that. Now, on, uh, of course, uh, the European uh, Parliament is making a huge investigation. We are waiting for the uh, results in December. Sometime, as I have to say, that the uh, U.S. is going to have his own report on the situation. Uh, in the Council of Europe, uh, the committee uh, of the Convention 108, uh, it, it, well, it is not uh, published yet, huh? But they are thinking of uh, an opinion, thinking, I mean, they are, they are writing by email, making, uh, uh, to, to, to say to the, the Council of Ministers uh, to insert within the Convention 108 in the article related to limitation of the rights, the, all the criteria on uh, interception and, uh, and everything that the Court of Human Rights in Europe, uh, based in Strasbourg, uh, put on through his jurisprudence. Uh, so um, it, it must be a laws in which you have the object. You want me to stop? I can stop. If you want to, to know the next, you will ask. No, we will address this. We will address this in conversation. Thank you, Marie. Uh, I'm trying to have the first warm up. Um, then you, Alexandrine. Yeah, just uh, to give a quick word of what, what Privacy International does so you understand the, the context in which uh, we're working. So we're the first international organization to work on the international level strictly on privacy issues. Um, and uh, our work involves working on an array of issues and with different uh, professions and sectors uh, to advocate for strong national, regional, international uh, frameworks to protect the right to privacy and data protection. Uh, so that, that's our, our main goal uh, in terms of the question asked uh, by the moderator. Um, so for us, we, we've really seen um, the impact of Snowden and the revelations in terms of really an acknowledgement and proofs that there was real time uh, and mass surveillance of citizens uh, by their own governments, but also by foreign governments. Um, and for us, it, it's been really uh, a challenge um, in terms, and it will help us in our work, to show that it's beyond the proportionate, necessary, and permitted by law limitations of the right to privacy. I mean, already these three elements are often contested, uh, but the actions taken by governments in the surveillance uh, and the re revelations have shown go well beyond those, those three principles. Um, and it's, it's gone beyond uh, just the mere collection and retention uh, to use for a specific purpose, as Marie-Georges mentioned. Uh, but now it's about retention for the if one day we need it case, uh, which leaves uh, broad uh, violations of human rights, which can occur now, but, but also in the future. And that's really worrying for, for the right to privacy of individuals, um, because there's no way for them to know when the data will be used and by whom, and no possibility for each data owner to give consent to this data being used. So there's different elements wi which the revelations um, have shed light on, which are really worrying. In terms of the trust, um, I think there are two aspects to that. Um, there's, we have to see how transparent uh, the governments uh, who have been put in, in the limelight um, have shown. Um, because how much are they actually telling us? Are all the revelations um, actually the whole story? Um, because if we start working on international principles to address the issues that emerge and were made public, 
do we really know that they'll satis you know they'll address all all the problems um, and another element and it's not just between the governments and citizens but it's also between states relations um, because certain governments didn't know the NSA were spying on them, uh, the EU was attacked as well, and I think there's a real problem to work on trust relations at that level as well uh, for us to be able to move forward. Um, because how can we expect states to have a dialogue together if there's no trust? Uh, so I think that's an important element as well. Thank you very much. Thanks for this first round. Uh, if any one of you has a question, please raise your hands. If not, um, well, Intergovernmental uh, discussion dialogue is really an important issue, and I would like to start with some of those. Um, uh, Margot, you, you, you mentioned, and I appreciate it, and thanks for your openness, you mentioned what it is that you feel government should do to restore confidence and trust. Um, I would like to have your take about precisely what's happening now in the European Union with the data protection regulation. Does it do that? Does it provide us with this? I know you are being extremely well involved in the process, so could you say a bit more about that? Thank you. So to some extent it will continue my answer to the previous question, because as I mentioned, yeah, this, uh, the work on general data protection has been, uh, regulation has been largely, um, uh, so the, mo the political motivation to, to finish uh, the work of this regulation is much bigger right now, yeah? And there has been some changes to the directive that immediately reflect, I think, the, uh, the PRISM revelations. And this is, for example, the article uh, 43A, um, which was reintroduced into the regulation that will limit, to some extent, um, or, or will give uh, European authorities or data controllers the right not to give uh, out uh, personal data uh, to, third, uh, to third countries uh, unless uh, they, um, well, there are certain uh, requirements that are fulfilled, yeah? So this is something that, will, that we don't have now uh, that will allow us a reaction or that will allow us a no to requests by, um, uh, by, by certain governments if we don't believe that this data will stay under control. So this article has been reintroduced to the uh, General Data Protection Regulation uh, after the uh, PRISM revelations, and I think it will stay there, yeah? And another sign how, how it helped us mobilize uh, was the fact that uh, just uh, on the 21st of October, I think it was Tuesday, right? Um, the Libre Commission in the European Parliament uh, has voted uh, and agreed on the General Data Protection Regulation, although there were 4,000 amendments to it. I think this is one of the records, yeah? 4,000 amendments that the uh, Commission had to work through, um, and they managed to agree on that in, with a, within a very reasonable um, time period, and now they will be um, negotiating uh, further possible changes within the uh, trialogue process. And we actually hope um, that it will be possible to, um, to agree on, on the final uh, wording and final, uh, final uh, shape of the d general data protection regulation um, till the end of this legisl legislature period, which is uh, in uh, spring next year. So this work is going fast right now, and we will really hope that it will keep the space. Uh, today and tomorrow, we have a European um, Council uh, meeting, which is a meeting at the level of head of states. So head of states are sitting right now, uh, maybe or in a um, couple of hours, because it's really early in Europe. Um, but they will be sitting today, and they will be probably discussing uh, which recommendations to give to the, uh, to the Commission and to the member states in terms of uh, digital agenda. Uh, and we hope and we expect that one of those will be to, to, um, to finalize quickly the work of this general data protection uh, regulation. And uh, let me tell you why we are so much in favor of this regulation. So first of all, uh, we are having like a big dialogue in Poland right now uh, with private sector um, representatives, with NGOs, uh, and with, uh, well, actually, it's a very open dialogue. We try to involve users, we try to involve students and, and young people um, around what kind of data, uh, data of privacy protection they want. And it's a very open dialogue, and it's only possible right now because we have this carrot, uh, namely this regulation. Yeah? So we, we were able to bring to one table uh, many very busy people who would otherwise uh, deal with something else to discuss how they imagine uh, a good regulation for data protection that would not be too restrictive 
uh, that would be open for innovation, but would also um, ensure us a, a level of protection that we want. Um, we managed to bring them together only because of this uh, general data protection uh, regulation, because it has immediate impact. We can have immediate impact on the shape of the, um, of the regulation by um, bringing in the input from our stakeholders. So we have this dialogue. Um, and actually, it was pretty clear from the very beginning that all stakeholders are in favor of one regulation for Europe. So it wasn't, you know, sometimes it seems that business might not be so much in favor of it, but actually business in Poland, maybe American business <laughs> could have a different opinion on that, but when we talk to people who are involved uh, in, in business, also close to data protection in Poland, they are really in favor of it because they see it um, as, as, um, as, as, as something that will also enable them to, easy, uh, to easily expand their businesses in other countries in Europe. Uh, why? Because previously, uh, in uh, current law is, is, the, is, is basically shaped by the directive from 95. Um, in, in the year 95, uh, Zuckerberg was 11, I believe, uh, and that's our current law that was then transposed into laws in member states uh, that differ from one another. So if you are a um, company, for example, a startup in Poland, and you want to expand to other countries, you have to stick to the uh, regulation of Poland that is based on this directive from 95. And then you have to, loo you have, to have a look how this uh, directive has been transposed in 27 other member states, which basically limits the market for startups from uh, 40 millions uh, to 40 millions for Poland and to less or more for different member states at first, yeah, because it's, it is a, quite a barrier to adjust to other regulations of, uh, of data protection. So, uh, so businesses are interested in having one regulation. They are also interested in adjusting current regulation to the digital age. Um, because right now we have a lot of bureaucratic obligations for companies that make no sense. Um, whereas companies think that we need more efficient rules that would also help the companies uh, preserve trust relationship with, uh, with the customers. Yeah? So, so they are interested in working together to find out those rules. Uh, and let me just tell you some examples um, of the rules that the uh, general regulation uh, will clarify. And this is, for example, uh, the definition of data protection, yeah? uh, of data, of personal data, sorry, the definition of personal data. So in 95, personal data was probably name, address, something like that, yeah? Right now in the digital age, it is much easier to identify a person based on other information. So we are not saying that, uh, so we are saying that uh, the definition of personal data must be much broader and it must be all information that allows for direct or indirect identification of a person. And this is a key adjustment and it's very needed in the digital age. I think it's obvious for all of us who use computers and know how much easier it is to find or Id identify a person based of, on sometimes random looking data. Another thing is a clear, uh, clear um, rules for profiling. Uh, so we, we don't want to restrict or, uh, or prohibit profiling, but we want to make it clear on what rules uh, companies can profile and what uh, consequences can come from profiling for consumers. And this is also clarified by, by this directive. I will not go into details because um, I got a yellow card, card already for uh, speaking time. Uh, so I would just mention a third change that this um, uh, regulation will introduce, and this is uh, one so-called one-stop shop. Uh, and this means that uh, as a consumer, as a citizen, uh, you will be able to go to your regional data protection uh, agency uh, if you feel that your rights are not being respected. Um, so this is, I think, um, a big advantage for, for many consumers who right now, uh, you know, we had this famous case of a German student who had to, uh, um, who had to fight uh, in court in Ireland with uh, Facebook, yeah, because he couldn't do it at home. Um, and for some consumers, it is important to be able to, uh, to, 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 to speak at home to the, to the potential complaints. Okay, I will finish with that. No, 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 yeah. Look, uh, uh, <laughs> as always, I need to be just a bit um, uh, rude with, 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 with you. I know but you do, I, so I really nothing. regret it. I really regret it, but, but, but time is, is what it is. Um, I, I've seen we have a questions, but before I give you the floor, uh, I, I would like to start from exactly what you said. It's really a good starting point. Uh, uh, and turn to my right, to my left, but I will turn first to my right, Sunil. How this conversation in Europe actually does impact your life in India? Mm. And it does it actually? 
If, if you look at the uh, title of our workshop, uh, Privacy from Regional Regulations to Global Connections, then one would assume that it would be regional privacy principles like the APEC privacy principles that would be directly relevant in the Indian context. Uh, you would be also making the assumption perhaps that human rights, like in Europe, is the driving imperative for privacy policy development in India. But you would be wrong on both those counts uh, because it is trade rather than human rights that is the primary imperative in India for dri driving privacy policy development. And because trade is the primary imperative and the European Union represents one of the main markets that the Indian outsourcing industry is interested in, citizens of India will have their right to privacy protected thanks to the lovely people in the European Union. That is the reality. Uh, so uh, we decided to work uh, this. Uh, we had an, a meeting with uh, Francois Libail, uh, the DG of Justice, the European Commission. And then we had informal meetings with Article 29 Working Party. Uh, then we decided to do it uh, IGF style, uh, have multi-stakeholder dialogue. Since the government was not drafting the bill in an open process, uh, we created a fraudulent civil society bill. And then we recruited two very important uh, corporate uh, consortia in India, uh, the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, and also the Data Security Council of India. DSCI is the self-regulatory organization for the outsourcing industry in India. Uh, we had uh, seven roundtables over a period of uh, four months across the country. Uh, we uh, had perhaps more than 200 participants at each of these roundtables. Uh, at the last roundtable, which finished just before I caught the plane uh, to come to this uh, IGF, uh, we had uh, uh, Commissioner Jakob Konstamp uh, from the Netherlands, also chairman of Article 29 Working Party, uh, Christopher Graham, who supports the chairman of Article 29, uh, both the Information and Privacy Commissioner from UK, and Chantal Bernier uh, from Canada, the Deputy Privacy Commissioner. Uh, this discussion, even though it is around a fraudulent bill produced by a completely irrelevant civil society organization, the organization I represent, the Center for Internet and Society, has thankfully raised the quality of discussion. Instead of saying silly things like Indians don't care for privacy because on uh, railway or train journeys they share very intimate details of their life, we are actually de uh, discussing details of the law. Because we cannot swing it 100% from zero omnibus horizontal statute to overly aggressive regulation of the industry. We want to protect innovation. Citizens benefit from innovation. And the end result is we've lost all our friends. So civil society accuses us of selling out and having a completely weak bill that allows the industry to do whatever they want. And our industry friends think that we are in some kind of conspiracy to over-regulate them. Uh, but at least the quality of discussion has improved. Uh, before I end, I'd like to say all of this is supported by Privacy International. Uh, thanks to their money and intellectual support, we are able to drive uh, this process in a credible fashion in India. Uh, so this is primarily the regional impact. It's not the region where we come from. It's some other random region, but we're very grateful for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and, and I would like to you, Joe, to take it from here, actually. So, um, we're hearing about the impact of some regional um, regulation or conversation in different parts of the world. So what's your take as a business, actually? First, are you happy with this? And I thought that we know the conversation shift from harmonization to something else. So could you say a few words on that, too? Sure. Let me, uh, let me first specifically respond to one region, since Margot specifically questioned whether American companies would, would be happy as Polish companies may be happy. Um, I think if we looked at the 
intent of the bill when it was being drafted to have a more effective privacy regulation, to lower administrative burdens, to enhance consumer trust, to enhance uh, user participation. All of those were shared objectives across the, ac across the stakeholders. I think when you look at the concept of a fragmented, uh, a fragmented directive implemented differently across all of the member states, uh, that was never something that business welcomed. That was something business always opposed, especially when you have the level of detail that some of the legislation got into, including at least one economy suggesting that there should be an eight-digit alphanumeric passcode in order to be privacy compliant. Uh, that level of detail in legislation is not actually helpful. Um, so I, I think that concept uh, I was, was well supported. I think the idea of the one-stop shop has morphed a little bit from its original idea as articulated by Vivian Redding, uh, because the one-stop shop had also been the concept that companies had a regulator to go to. Now, interestingly, companies had introduced the concept that the one-stop shop, which was, and this is why it's beneficial for the companies to have one regulator to go to. Uh, the reason why it's beneficial is that that regulator gets to know you over time. The investigative process becomes actually a much more logical process then because they have an accumulated knowledge over the company over a period of time. The fact that the regulation is a regulation as opposed to the directive means that it's not transposed into national law, which means that it's a harmonized application of a law. The fact that there's a consistency mechanism to make sure that the law is applied in a consistent fashion means that you don't have data protection commissioners who are outliers. Isn't, industry, however, did raise the fact that we were concerned that when only talking about a one-stop shop for industry, you actually in some ways disenfranchise the data protection authority of the data subject. Because clearly the data subject should always be able to go to just their data protection authority. And therefore, the same way a business can go to its data protection authority based on its locus of operations, the data subject should be able to go to their data protection authority and somehow you should have a conciliation process between those two in the context of the investigatory process and its resolution. Um, the, the only other issue I'll, I'll take up just on, on the details was um, the definition of personal data is fine, except you have to also look for the unintended consequences. And this is where I think business is perhaps reluctant with where the regulation is. Not with its objectives, not with what it wants to achieve, but in its detail. Because for instance, under the current, under the current definition of personal data in the directive, an IP address is personally identifiable information. Now to be honest, this has been something that has been established in most DPAs across Europe for a while. So it's not that this was news. But the unintended consequence is the IP address is used for security verification in a number of cases, whether it's virus checking, whether it's adaptive access control, whatever. If you need to get consent before you can use it for that purpose, you can potentially undermine some of those issues. So the question isn't whether the concept is okay. The question is, do we have unintended consequences in the application of the concept? And that's where a lot of the discussion has entered. It's not the main principles of the regulation, because in all honesty, the main principles of the regulation are very similar to the principles of the directive, which as Marie-Georges has pointed out, are universal principles that exist. The question really is, at the level of the details and their implementation and the potential for unintended consequences related to those. To get more precisely to the question you asked me, yeah. um, uh, uh, so the concept is the regional implications. And uh, as Sunil pointed out, uh, you know there, there is work going on in APEC. The APEC privacy framework was adopted a number of years back. Under APEC, there's the concept of cross-border privacy rules. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it out loud once, but then I'm going to call it a CBPR after that. Under the, under the, in the European Union, as a concept under the directive and more firmly established under the draft regulation, there's the concept of a binding corporate rule. Both of these are ways in which companies can share, affiliate, can share information across affiliates through a set of rules that are overseen uh, by either a designated agent or an authority. In the case of APEC, it's a designated agent that is certified by an authority and then to which an authority stands over them. Uh, in the European Union, it's directly by the authority. 
but the BCR and the CBPR have a lot of commonality besides just the letters in their names, which is confusing. Um, and that commonality is now the subject of a work product between APEC and a number of European players. Uh, the Keneal, the ICO's office in the UK, um, the German Data Protection Commissioner, the EDPS, which is the European Data Protection Supervisor, uh, and representatives of the Commission. And what they're doing is they're saying, okay, let's take a look at a CBPR, and let's take a look at a BCR, and let's do a mapping, and see what kind of overlap there exists in the requirements and the level of validation across these two systems. And while they haven't finished the mapping yet, the best guess is that it'll come somewhere between 70 and 80 percent overlap of commonality of obligations. And so the answer is, this isn't mutual recognition. Because the answer is, you're not doing everything the other person is doing, so you don't get credit for doing 100 percent. But the question becomes, how do I give you credit for doing the 80 percent you do do, so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel on that 80 percent, and then how do we figure out how you prove the other 20 percent that you're not doing? So the idea is to create efficiencies because, as Marie George also pointed out, we don't have a UN charter on these issues that has created a global norm. While we have global principles, there isn't a global law. So the question is, how do we start to have interoperability across systems, such as the European Union does with adequacy, for instance? How do we have interoperability across systems where we can streamline some of the complexities of compliance without either diminishing the standards against which compliance will be judged or the requirements that are inherent in that compliance, because you're, you're still not saying that 80 percent is good enough. What you're saying is we'll give you credit for your 80 percent, but now we have to figure out how you do the 20 percent. And that part of the process has not been defined. They're still trying to figure out how to get to that part of the process because they haven't finished the mapping. But as far as I'm concerned, that interoperability is a practical solution to what is a, a lack of global harmonization and a less, a lot, you know, it's not likely that global harmonization at the legal instrument level will happen anytime soon. So it's a practical step on how to move things forward without diminishing the standards of privacy, but perhaps by creating some greater flexibility in how we adapt to them. Well, thank you, Joe. You have opened so many fronts, and I'm happy that you addressed some of these issues because it will nicely fit with the next, um, my next questions to, to you, Marie. But before I get there, I understand we have some questions from the audience, so please introduce yourself and ask your question. Yeah, YJ Park from SUNY Korea. And actually, uh, Joe explained a lot of sort of the interesting uh, things which I was very interested about this global harmonization process. And then, but probably like if you can add, like uh, I'm wondering whether uh, EU's like GDR, GDPR uh, is also like playing some role in this kind of process of the uh, harmonization together with this APEX like a CBPR. And this, my second question actually with uh, Nigel Water, uh, who, uh, am I right, your name? Nigel works for Privacy International. Oh, yeah, yeah, the, the lady, the next to you? She, oh, no, she no, works the, for Privacy. Alex is yeah, working yeah, for... Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, Council of Europe? Yeah, yeah. Marie, Marie yeah. George. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, I found that her uh, intervention was, well, presentation was very interesting about this cloud service and this uh, sensitivity about the data, and especially from the sovereign, uh, you know, the countries, uh, the, the national the government. And so a lot of the uh, governments these days, uh, they are like uh, forming the task force about the privacy, including Korea, which I've been involved with one of those uh, task forces on privacy now. And they are interested in like, you know, how uh, countries around the world now are responding to this kind of the sensitive situation where most of the cloud service, uh, the servers are located uh, outside of their country. And under this situation, they cannot really force people not to use a certain, you know, the social network services like Facebook and uh, YouTube and, you know, the uh, Twitter. And on the other hand, they are very concerned about the data 
have been controlled by somewhere else where they cannot have any control over. So under this situation, you know, what would be the role for the government and what would be the role for the other stakeholders, like including the civil society and other sectors? Yeah, your response would, to this would be highly appreciated. I don't know if I can uh, answer directly to that question because it's an industry or uh, thing. Uh, what surprised me is that, uh, of course, uh, with the Snowden business, and I have been uh, writing with others a petition to support him uh, with very high-ranked uh, French person. Um, what I see is that uh, in the global situation, people, the users of uh, internet, we are not that much shocked. I am, I, I, it's amazing because now it is in the hand of everyone every day. So the regular, uh, excuse me for the word, the regular people, they, they still go on uh, Twitter and, and others. It's more the political, uh, society, huh? those like you and me and so forth. So the rapport de force is not that good for the moment. Uh, we talk about dialogue and everything. We had been completely spied and we talk about dialogue. Uh, it, it is a little bit unbalanced, but I okay. I, 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 so, um, so that's the real situation. I think, uh, uh, I am sure the uh, US is going to uh, to stop certain things, but not everything. And that's why I think we have to work a lot on uh, our national uh, legislation and international also on up to which point you can use mass uh, surveillance uh, uh, tools. Uh, ORAC said uh, we, uh, we need those tools for security and we don't want to ask the consent. I'm sorry, under the data protection principles, uh, the, the, the purpose of security of your own system, I'm not going, talking about the security of the whole world where you spy everywhere, no. The security of the system of information, which for the moment require some very intrusive tools, is a perfectly legitimate purpose. You don't need the the consent of everyone for that. I add that there is a need of those people in charge of the security of the system to be protected by a confidentiality duty. So the head of the enterprise of, or the government won't ask them to follow one and one <laughs> person, okay? Then, control for the sovereignty of all this. And I can give you the list of uh, requirements. It is quite long list. You have to put in the law. Huh? This is a, requi a, a democratic requirement. You have to have a law to say in which cases for national security uh, purpose uh, you need to make some surveillance. You have to put who does that. You have to put down which, which, uh, with, uh, with which means you have to put a procedure of control, a priori, a posteriori, both, huh? except in urgency. And you have to put down transparency me means. So each year, there is at least, there is a report to the parliament and to the public on, on under which uh, breach there was a need of surveillance how many cases have been accepted? How many cases have not been accepted by the independent body? How many cases? Huh? Uh, and the control the, after the, the result and the recommendations for further. Um, th this has to be done. And uh, we think that in the Convention 108, it will be put under the, it will be, uh, put under the, under the, um, the directive. Uh, it, it is already, some part of that is already in the regulation of EU, which is under uh, consideration. Uh, I have to say also that uh, more bro broadly, under data protection principles and application to be efficient, 
there is a need that not only those who collect your data, huh, but also those which produce services and those which produce products, uh, smartphones and everything, has some duties. Huh? All the principles that relate to the phase of design, that what they're doing, should be put inside. This will be uh, in the modernized uh, convention 108 also. Uh, on the one-stop shop uh, in the EU, I would like to say that in practice, and it's going to evaluate a little bit, because um, a, a data processing is always surrounded by some laws. For instance, if you take the how you are paid, the rules to make your uh, wage, huh? many lines. There is no one, there is no two uh, member states in Europe where they are the same requirement. So there are always in Europe local things. So of course, uh, <laughs> the DPA of, uh, of the local uh, who knows the laws will be in. Uh, will be in uh, that's of course. And I saw some uh, draft that will take care of that. Thank you for everyone. Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah, I just wanted to, there was a question in there for me as well I wanted to answer. Um, so the, 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 the GDPR is obviously being considered in the APEC process because uh, the, the concept of the binding corporate rules that they're working on while it exists under the directive is much more clarified under the, uh, the draft data protection regulation. And I would have to believe that the EDPS, the ICO, the CNIL, and the German Data Protection Commissioner are looking at the definition of binding corporate rules under the GDPR, not just how they are working currently under the directive as they're doing their mapping. So I would presume, I mean, I can't speak on, be, on their behalf, but I would presume that they are looking at the instrument on the table as well as they're doing the mapping and understanding what the requirements would be. Um, just to bounce off actually something that Marie uh, pointed out, beyond the data protection and laws, there's a need to um, yeah, regulate the way governments are, are deploying and using surveillance te technologies. Uh, so with a group of around 10 NGOs, and it's now been signed on by more than 200 civil society organizations, uh, we launched in September 2013 the principles on the application of human rights to the communication surveillance. Uh, and they were presented at the Human Rights Council, and they were welcomed by a number of member states. Um, and it's really important that, that these laws are not meant to be, these principles are, are not meant to be new laws. There are already laws in place which should already be protecting citizens but they're not enforced. And we want these principles just to be used as benchmarks by governments as they're reassessing and reviewing their surveillance policies and, and laws uh, following the revelations about how they're gonna take uh, the issue forward and how they're gonna get the trust back of their citizens. Uh, and one of the first countries to have responded positively to these principles is Sweden, who last week at the conference in Seoul uh, put forward seven principles that they're going to push forward on. And internal sources have told us that the 13 principles were very influential in, in defining the principles that Sweden uh, will apply uh, in, in its own, um, yeah, in its own surveillance uh, systems. Um, and they've, so there are seven principles out of the 13 we had are legality, legitimate aim, necessity, adequacy, proportionality, judicial authority, transparency and public oversight. And I think these seven principles come up, have come up in the discussions today about um, data owners having um, a body to go to, to to get redress and reparation for their violations, uh, but also states having to justify every step of the way about why they're collecting this data, what it's gonna be used for, and to justify that to citizens. Um, so I think it's really important to maybe take initiatives like the one we've tried to develop as a group of organizations uh, to push the issue forward um, because we all know there's no point in imposing on governments um, because from civil society they're just going to, they're not going to take ownership of these principles but just to work with them to raise awareness about the human rights impact of their practices and see how, so how we can push that forward. So we hope Sweden will lead the way and that other governments will, will push in that direction as well. 
Yeah, to comment on, uh, it, on the same line. Uh, yes, and those principles uh, had been written in, in a comment uh, 16 in 1988 uh, uh, at the UN according to Article 17 of the Pact. Uh, okay, so we are still on and uh, maybe this time uh, w we will do it. Except that everybody has to respect and who is going to control on world level, that's the problem. Huh? So we have to go to up to that because we knew since the beginning that uh, with computers you can do things on the right side or a, a very bad side, huh? surveillance. We knew that from the beginning. So up to now we accompanied uh, the data processing with all those principles. Now uh, we, we need to have commitment of everybody not to go on the other side. So it means also that when there is cooperation between several uh, intelligence services, this contract must be allowed by also the independent body which, uh, which control the interceptions. That's very important. Also, uh, there is a principle which is that the, inform the, person, the person who is uh, intercept, uh, who is monitored, must be informed as soon as possible. Uh, everybody uh, forget that. Of course, uh, when it is possible. But this principle is very important in the, uh, democracy. Now, uh, uh, about uh, BCR and the relation between APEC uh, system, uh, CBPR, and the, the BCR. Well, I know well uh, the logic of BCR because as the contractual solutions, they had been invented by France <laughs> in the 80s. Okay. Uh, uh, why we had to put uh, in Europe this BCR with a certain level of protection and why it is not the case in APEC? Because when the APEC, uh, I mean, for the moment, as our president said uh, since the beginning, all these instruments on the international level, whether binding or not, they are compatible. But some are higher than others. And it's the case in Europe and uh, of the convention, but maybe you are interested to know. In the principle, the privacy principle of APEC, they had been adopted right after the safe harbor agreement between EU and US, which is under consideration now because of the, the, the mass spying which came up. Huh? At that time, uh, US accepted to, to, to give up two things the right to use publicly available data for free, I mean, without any uh, other consideration. And the other one is the harm test about remedies and so forth. Europe could not accept these two things. There is no publicly available data as such. When you make public a data, there is always a purpose behind, and you have to respect it. Huh? But this was not. So, these two things are in the APEC uh, privacy uh, framework on 2004. Now, in that region, you have countries with laws. Canada, New Zealand, Australia for years and years and years. And so when they saw those principles, they said, well, we have to get in and re make our laws recognized. So in the APEC system arrangement, huh, it is said that you have to respect the laws <laughs> when they are. <laughs> so we go back to the beginning, uh, uh, to the need of international uh, agreement. Uh, and that's all because the principles are the same. Some, sometimes for political reasons, some industry were able to push and to lobby in a way which interested, which is against their uh, long-term benefits, I am sure. Wow, thank you. Um, well, again, I, I, I like um, the discussion and conversation and where it goes now. Uh, I would like to continue on that basis and the principle we just described. I know there are several questions in the room. I hope they goes in the same way. I mean, gentlemen, you were asking for a question? Uh, it was responded to already. Wonderful, so who was next? This gentleman, I guess, right? Thank you, Phyllis. 
uh, Ian Fish, BCS uh, UK, uh, Chart Institute for IT. I'm not sure whether I'm going to continue on your line or not, uh, because one I'm thing sure I thought I was coming to was something to do with how regional. I thought. You got a nasty echo. Please, please. I will give you my mic. Well, it might be just the way I'm using it. Okay, I think <laughs> I'll think go a bit I further away. Yeah. Um, I thought we were going to be talking about uh, how regional will translate into global. And, uh, and listening to Sunil, and what in effect, I know I'm overstating this, but in effect was a rather cynical way of, of dealing with something which wasn't uh, a grounds, uh, entirely a groundswell from within, but it was a, 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 a responding to a need to do business with the EU. Uh, I, I wondered about cultural uh, issues and how they would affect even if you did have a, a, any sort of uh, correspondence. For example, um, there are cultural differences even within Europe, as we know. For example, I'm not defending it, but the, the way that the UK uh, implemented the directive was, say, very, very different from the way Spain or Germany implemented the directive. Uh, so that's why the regulations come about, obviously. Um, but I wondered, you know, the APEC principles, for example, I mean, how do they res resonate culturally in places like Japan, the Philippines, Indonesia? Are they the same or are they different? How does what Sonal described resonate within, within India and will it have any effect in reality? Uh, and then what about South America? We haven't heard anything about that. Uh, in regional, the regional aspect seems to be a bit missing in what we're doing. Um, I think it was perhaps four years ago when I met uh, uh, the director of uh, Privacy International, Gus Hussain, and I told him that privacy is not an issue in India. Uh, but after that, the government of India has rolled out several surveillance projects, starting with the UID project, then the NAT, -Git, NAT Grid project, then the CMS project, and uh, there were some very high-level leaks of uh, interceptions, uh, recordings of Ratan Tata, very important businessman in our country, were made available on the internet, published in uh, national magazines. And, some, and overnight, something that was completely not an issue for India became an issue for India. And uh, civil society began to complain loudly. If you just look at uh, social media today, and use keywords such as UID, CMS, NatGrid, uh, you can see a nation uh, complaining. Uh, I completely take your point that uh, there is cultural relativism. I'm not saying it's completely absent. But it isn't the case that for Indians, there is no concern about privacy at all. And it is a recent phenomena. So my research center is doing a project which will interrogate Vedic law, Islamic law, uh, pre-colonial law in India during the Mughal time. And uh, I'm quite confident we will demonstrate uh, that across uh, centuries, uh, privacy has always been a concern. Uh, perhaps we don't have the exact term, and perhaps we call it different things, but uh, definitely there is a, a larger and longer history to privacy policy development in India, and it is not just uh, something that has emerged after the internet. So how then will uh, we implement this cultural difference if we are going to adhere to global principles? That is the complicated question. Uh, providing detail about HIV AIDS prevalence at the level of a village may not cause any harm in Europe. But in India, if HIV AIDS prevalence data was published at the village level, there can be stigma and discrimination. So there are uh, uh, tests that will be applied by judges, uh, the harm principle test, uh, the public interest test to balance the right to information versus the right to privacy. 
And it is in these tests that the cultural difference will show. Uh, so I'm relatively confident uh, we can globally harmonize principles without road rolling over cultural differences. Uh, this is, of course, assuming that law enforcement agencies and uh, judges, the judiciary within, within India gets up to speed with uh, privacy jurisprudence. So that is the uh, requirement. But your concern is very real. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are we going, are we going live here or not? Just, just <laughs> I just need a minute, uh, because actually I thought your answer was very informative and it was very, well, uh, deeply rooted in, uh, in, in your culture that you know, and it was really great. Uh, but I just wanted to reflect quickly on the examples of the cultural differences that I tend to hear at a uh, conference like that, that I might repeat, but I want to just reflect on them. Yeah. So usually you would hear examples like, for example, I don't know, that uh, there is cultural differences because, for example, f uh, French and German people, they are not afraid of uh, going naked to the beach, but they wouldn't uh, like they, uh, they like um, um, their um, payment data to be released, yeah, and things like that. And it's uh, a little bit trivial to some extent because I think, like, so, so these are like the little differences that you may name but actually, I don't think they change a lot to the core of the regulations that we are talking about. And the core is usually uh, to give the people the chance to remain in control of their data and to be able to agree and to be able to remain in control of what is happening of their data. And, I, and there, I don't feel that there is um, big uh, differences uh, between um, uh, regions. Where I do, what surprised me actually the most and then when, where I see the real, a real difference um, but it's uh, rather about balancing different values was the reaction to prism uh, in Europe and in the US, yeah? where in the US it was really uh, visible and prominent that many people didn't mind because they thought the security um, issues are so important and they didn't really see uh, the relevance to democracy and to human rights uh, protection um, the way we, see we saw it in Europe. Yeah? So that's something that I thought uh, re reaffirmed uh, what tends to be said about um, the different uh, roots of privacy in Europe and in the United States. Thank you very much. Can I continue the line and then you, gentlemen? Just a quick comment. Um, <laughs> just a quick comment on, on, on the cultural and maybe regional um, differences. I was in Senegal a few weeks ago on a workshop on data protection in Francophone Western Africa, and it is an element that came through very strongly. It's not that privacy is not an issue. It's just that in, it's interpreted differently, um, and that, that has to be reflected in the national laws, but also in the regional uh, context. Um, ECOWAS is working on a data protection um, policy and, and legislative framework, um, and at the national level, the, the, the organizations are pushing for this cultural aspect to be taken into account, because if not, the people themselves will just reject the, even the very fact that they have rights saying, this is not linked to my reality. And that's something that's, that is being talked about. Um, and so that is reassuring that even the people advocating for privacy are taking to, into account these cultural uh, differences, but not eliminating, eliminating the fact that privacy is a concern. <laughs> From my experience of 40 years, and uh, including on international level, I can say that uh, the application, the basic principles, uh, purpose, limit, uh, limit, uh, <laughs> legitimacy, uh, proportionality, and so forth, they are felt in situation exactly the same. I was uh, astonished to read reports from Japan in the 80s. I could have I read, I wrote exactly the same on the same topic. Now, what are the real difference? They are in, in, I know, what is uh, sensitive data? In South Africa, I mean, in South of the uh, uh, desert, the name of your mother has to be really protected. Because it, it can be, you can be touched through your mother, if, if something is going with uh, marabou and so forth. Um, so it's, it's about the, the only thing I, I found as sensitive data difference 
from, of course, sensitive data also has some differences in Europe. Huh? It is like a political opinion in France. It is normal in Germany and in North countries. Huh? To be a member of a trade union is no problem. You even pay your cotisation on your wage in Germany. And even the, the money you give to your church is taken from your wage. This is impossible in France. So there are some differences like that that you have to take in account. Huh? That's what the one-shop uh, business uh, can maybe work, but not uh, you know, everything. Now, the huge difference, in my view, is on the question of liberté d'expression, right to speech. Here, yes. Huh? Clinton, with the business of his, uh, with his uh, girl, was shocking for all data protection commissioners in the world. And we even took a resolution on that at that time. We were shocked. The fact that all the Nazi uh, sites are in the US is terrible for, for Europe. Huh? So under the freedom of speech, it's true that there are very huge differences. In, and everywhere in the world, and decency, same thing. I mean, it's, it has something to do with uh, freedom of expression. So on this topic, yes. But on the basic question of data protection, we call uh, normally no. And what about, uh, and why I am really for uh, world discussions? Huh? When I hear India, it's incredible huh? uh, to hear, because now I'm sure we could agree about uh, digital fingerprints, DNA, huh? the, your project in which a French enterprise, the leader of the world on d digital fingerprints is. We had to fight huh, for years and years up to the Council of, um, of Constitution huh, in order to get rid in France of a, a, a nation, national database with eight fingerprints, eight, not to say because, because 10, that's surely police. But 8, it's because you are 60 million. So, to the, so I said to the, poli, to the political people, what about the Chinese and the Indian? I guess their feet won't be enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, I just want to pick up, since the question was also perhaps how the APEC economies uh, have managed it, and I was part of that, that process. Uh, so first off, the APEC process was twofold. One was the creation of a set of principles. They were actually based on the OECD guidelines. And then what was elaborated beyond that was the accountability principles of the OECD guidelines were actually restructured more along the concept of accountability that exists in the Canadian privacy law, PIPIDA. So the concept that obligation flows with the information is something that's also inherent in the APEC principles. And then as Marie George pointed out, there's a harm concept which is meant to be an interpretive principle which is meant to create a risk-based framework inherent in the document. Um, just because that concept is you have to apply a law in context and that was one of the ways you consider the context, but harm was not meant to be merely financial. So you could have a harm based on collection just like you could have a harm based on use. Um, so that was, that was the way that went. But a lot of economies in Asia Pacific that are members of APEC, so for those who don't know, APEC, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, is essentially the economies that have a Pacific rim, a, a Pacific coast. Uh, so sometimes you don't think about the fact that Russia is there, parts of South America are there, so just, just to round out the, the story. So a number of those economies didn't, didn't really have a position necessarily at the beginning of that on privacy. A number of them, New Zealand, Australia, et cetera, they already had laws related to privacy. So part of the work was capacity building. Part of the work was outreaching to those countries that didn't have a law to say, you may want to consider these principles in developing a law. And we used to do workshops on capacity building to help uh, economies think about how these principles could be applied in a law. The other part then became practical. So that's where the CBPRs came in. So the concept was, you have companies within these economies that are exchanging information. And how do we raise the bar to make sure that the exchanges of those information are at least compliant with the APEC process? 
And so the CBPRs really deal with when you get to an international transfer. They do not deal with what happens in country. So for instance, if you are in Australia and you are collecting information in Australia and it is maintained in Australia, then you are subject solely to Australian law. What happens in the CBPR is it's created a system whereby a company has to, be, has to participate. In order to participate, you have to be vetted and you have to sign up to the level of protection. Then you are overseen either directly by an authority or by an accountability agent. That accountability agent also has to be vetted in order to participate to demonstrate that they have the capacity to enforce. The last thing is economies that wish to participate are also vetted and demonstrate that their law is in fact sufficient as well. So it's a three-tiered version of that vetting. But because not every economy was at the same place, because if you think about the Asia Pacific, there are different cultural aspects, there are different legal aspects, there are different levels of development and adoption of laws. So what happened was we built a pathfinder. Uh, a pathfinder is apex speak for a project in which people can join so that they can move along with the project but don't have to commit to all elements of the project yet. And 16 of the economies were part of the Pathfinder project to develop the CBPR. And so, in essence, the regional network has kind of s grown over time of people moving in this direction. And then the interoperability work that started to go on uh, with the European Union is starting to look at how we bridge across the regions as well. So both within APEC, there's been, there's been the coalescence of the region around a set of principles, and then now across Europe, it's not necessarily a coalescence as much as an interoperability of instruments. That is very nice. Thank you, uh, Joe. It, it might be uh, one of the conclusions of today. Uh, I'm really afraid uh, we're running out of time. It's 12.30. We're just starting this conversation. It's already, and I hold you have to have the bad role of finishing it. Um, before I do that, uh, I would like each of you in just, well, one line, and I will, you know me, huh? I will be extremely rude with my, my little carton. Um, um, w there are, we are all consumers too in this room, so what it is, what would be the take for a consumer here in this room if he needs to remember something, uh, his take in terms of whatever trust or uh, personal data is the new all of, uh, of, uh, in, this, in this new era, what do you want the consumers to know? Who would like to start? Do you want? So I think a consumer should know that you should try to read terms of services, try to, uh, and you should, and you have a lot of impact on companies how clear those are. So we can ask the companies to innovate in terms of delivering as clear uh, uh, instructions with pictures, and they can do that. They are really able to do that, and we can, we just need to ask for them because uh, for that because I don't think it's the role of law. Uh, law will not be able to force companies to be re really clear and communicative with us, but a consumer can. Uh, consumers should know that uh, Snowden's revelations won't just lead to the acceleration of uh, globalization of ICANN oversight, but also the ac acceleration of uh, privacy policy harmonization. Um, just re reiterating the point about users, um, you know, also acknowledging that they have a right to privacy and they, take, they have the possibility at the moment, I mean, it's limited, but to, to enforce themselves, their, their own right to privacy by opting in, opting out, reading the small characters at the bottom of contracts uh, and paying attention to, to that sort of thing and also paying attention to what they put on Facebook and Twitter. Um, also, I think it's important to, to raise awareness about what exists um, in terms of reparation already now? I mean, there are already in many countries data protection uh, commissions that they can approach. And I think it's really important uh, for, for individuals to, to go forward and find out what rights they do have. Uh, I think one of the things is too often we use the word balance when we should be considering how to optimize because it's not a zero-sum game. You can have the whole be larger than the sum of its parts. And I think the other thing is, as we look at what might be long-term solutions, 
we shouldn't dismiss potential practical advantages to make things better as we go along the way, such as interoperability, because those are solutions that help bridge some of the systems without diminishing the standards across systems. Can I, just to follow up on my point, just to add, we don't think that it's the fault of users, that they're not aware of these things, that their rights should be violated. There is a responsibility at the higher level, uh, so just to make that clear. Um, uh, act uh, towards your uh, friends, relatives, and so forth uh, in a way that they, got, they get the reflex. Huh? Once you got understood something in privacy, then in all cases you can do it. Get the reflex. It's not awareness. Awareness is flat. Got the reflex. Then, of course, there are the practical solutions that you have to invent every day. Huh? But you have also to see the, the long term. In the long term, I am quite afraid huh? because the, the balance between security and, <laughs> and privacy is always very instable in a country. Huh? A country can derive huh? from more democratic to non-democratic. And think what you do when you have a database of 60, 600 millions of people in India with all their fingerprints, face and everything in the database. This is really a, a world we changed and with mass surveillance an impossibility to resist to anything which is going on. No, so we, there, there are the, the everyday solution and there are the long term of which society we are, constru we are building with nice IT, uh, bad ITs, all those connected to your body. It's like being in the Middle Ages. Huh? Thank you very much, Marie. Thank you very much, everybody. Would please help me clapping this wonderful panel. Thank you. And I hope we continue the discussion with something to eat. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>